It is a family, and he was the heart of it. This was Mr. B's place. His leadership, determination, and passion permeated these halls. Pat Bowen would always say the Broncos really belonged to Denver, and Denver deserved to have a number one team. He fought hard to transform a struggling organization into one of the best franchises in sports. Three Super Bowl championships. Gifts loyal to Bronco fans and a legacy left for our entire state. From Pat Bowen, Mile High Legend. Welcome to a very special show, Pat Bowen, a Mile High Legend. Over the next hour, Mike Kliss and I, along with several special guests, will look back at the life and career of the Broncos Hall of Fame owner. And Mike, today's public tribute, just another example of how Pat Bowen meant so much to so many. Over at Mile High Stadium today, they were supposed to go from 10 until 3 o'clock. Yeah. At 3 o'clock, the line was still backed mm. out for another mm. two hours. The Broncos said, we're not keeping anyone from coming and paying tribute to Mr. B. They let it continue. More than 5,000 people in all took part. Yeah, and they got uh, a nice treat as far as uh, all the artifacts that they have. You see that gold jacket there? That's actually a replica, not the actual yes. gold jacket that's uh, controversial right now. We'll, uh, hopefully he gets his real Better black jacket. But, you know, you had people dressed up all kinds of different ways. You had guys in suit and ties. You had uh, ladies in the formal dresses. You also had the costumes out there, Orange Vader. Uh, the limo driver, you had the Mile High Prophet. Uh, people were dressed all kinds of different ways. You had uh, dignitaries like Michael Hancock, and then just the common fan. It was, a, it was a wonderful day. It really was a tremendous event. Now, as far as Mr. B, this is a guy who wanted to be number one basically at everything, and there were a lot of things he was. We all knew Mr. Bolin as the Broncos owner, a very good one at that. What you might not have known is he really was a fascinating man with a unique background. With Mr. B's passing late Thursday night, yes, it was a mournful time, but this is also a time to reflect and celebrate a wonderful life. I'm not involved in football for, for ego gratification or for the publicity that surrounds it. I'm involved in it for a career. When Pat Bolin first bought the Broncos in 1984, he was often described as Canadian Pat Bolin, which misrepresented his background. Patrick Dennis Bolin was born February 18, 1944, in Prairie du Chien, Wisconsin, where he grew up and played hockey, receiver in football, and ran middle distance races in track for a high school that no longer exists. He then attended the University of Oklahoma, where he earned his business degree in 1965 and law degree in 1968. At that point, he moved to Edmonton, Alberta, where he became a lawyer for his father Paul's oil company. Through his father's wildcatting success and his own resourcefulness, Pat Bolin began building wealth through real estate, oil and gas. In 1983, Bolin started looking into buying a professional sports franchise. He explored the NHL and Canadian Football League before he met Edgar Kaiser through mutual friends. In 1984, Bolin, along with his brother John and sister Mary Beth, bought just over 60% of the Broncos from Kaiser for 51 million. Bolin didn't mess it up though. He always considered himself more of a steward to Denver's football franchise than the Broncos owner. In return, Bolin gave the fans an insatiable will to win. The throw, touchdown! He struck a delicate balance between loyalty to the men running his football department and trying to quickly correct his mistakes. Each day when he showed up at Broncos headquarters, Bolin's first stop was in the trainer's room, where he would chat with head trainer Steve Greek Antonopoulos, who is now in his 43rd season with the team. Bolin's compassion and concern for the players was clearly evident during his ownership of the team. 
Perhaps most astounding of Bolin's accomplishments as Broncos owner was the team suffered just five losing seasons during his 30 years of active ownership. It was after the Broncos won their first Super Bowl by defeating the heavily favored Green Bay Packers. You got the world champions! The Broncos have done it! They have shocked everybody and they have won Super Bowl 32. In San Diego, that Bolin uttered his most memorable words as owner. This one for John. Amid uproarious applause, Boland then handed the trophy over to his star quarterback, John Elway. One year later, the franchise would repeat the feat of winning the world championship in Super Bowl 33. Denver Broncos have beaten the Atlanta Falcons 34 to 19, and they are world champions once again. This gave Boland the pleasure of raising the trophy and this time dedicating the victory to Bronco fans. As Shanahan was earning acclaim as a mastermind in the mid to late 1990s, Bolin shifted his focus to league matters. He helped usher the NFL from large planet within the sporting world to its own galaxy. His biggest contributions? Bolin helped bring Fox on board and Sunday Night Football on NBC. Philanthropy was also very important to Bolin. He and the Denver Broncos charities have donated more than 25 million to various groups since 1993. But with Alzheimer's in its early onset stage, Bolin understood he needed to step back from the team's day-to-day -day operations and bring in someone he could trust to run football operations. And so Bolin hired Elway. In January 2011, Bolin put Elway in charge of football operations while elevating Joe Ellis from chief operating officer to team president. And I, I'm going to say this, and you would not want me to say this, but this one's for Pat! Pat Bolin leaves behind his wife, Annabelle, who was diagnosed in 2018 with Alzheimer's and seven children from two marriages. One of the Bolin children is expected to eventually take over the team. Whoever is picked to sit behind Bolin's desk, however, will not have it easy. It might even be impossible for him or her to match their father's success. Pat Bolin was simply the best owner in Denver sports history. Emotional for sure, looking back there. I want to kind of reiterate what the Bolin family said. Heaven just got a little more orange and blue. You saw it there in the piece. He enjoyed being with the team, yep. with the victories. John Elway, Terrell Davis both called him a pretty cool dude. But it was more than just about football with Mr. B. It was also about family, Mike. Sure was. I mean, he, and he had the, the seven children. And he did want his lasting wish is he wanted one child who earned it to sit in his chair someday because he said he loved running the Broncos, loved owning it. It's a lot of fun, especially if you win, of course. And uh, that's his wish, and I, I do think that's going to be carried out. And that will take time, and we'll see what happens down the road. And now as far as uh, where he goes, I mean, we all think of him as Canada, Denver, but he's got ties elsewhere too. Sure does, Hawaii. That was uh, Pat Boland's second home where he spent a lot of time in the offseason. His two oldest daughters uh, lived there. He was quite the canoe surfer, and that activity was where he bonded with his kids. The thing that we did together was we canoe surfed. Mm -hmm. My dad was an incredible canoe surfer. His best friend was Fred Hemmings, probably the most talented steersman in the US um, or the world. And we'd take out the, the canoe and have a great time. Well, it's basically the same thing as regular surfing, but you're in a canoe and you're not by yourself. You're with 
two, three, four other individuals. So you have to work as a team to enjoy what you're doing otherwise. And he balanced his life with going to Hawaii and, and canoe surfing and he balanced his life with the, his achievements in the triathlon and his marathons. Well, I thought he was trying to drown us at times because he would take us out canoe surfing and we would be in literally still in floaties and, you know, he'd take us on these, he, at the time I thought were tsunamis and, you know, flip the boat and Beth and I would be literally floating around like little uh, in toys in the ocean and he'd gather us up, put us back in the boat and we'd go back out and do it again. <laughs> You know, you see Mr. B there on that uh, on that canoe, that kayak. Oh, it was a little scary. In fact, it was funny listening to John Elway tell the story about he did it one time with Mr. B, but then after the big crash on the water, <laughs> with John still playing, he said, not, this not, is a yeah, idea. Not smart. That's right. Uh, that's uh, you got to know what you're doing in that sport. It, it's so fun to hear the stories from the players about what Mr. B was like. He was not in any way your typical owner. In fact, recently uh, we caught up with Rod Smith and Terrell Davis, two of his favorite, who talked about the owner. A man can't, he's gonna leave his work still here on this earth. And he left his work and his kids. He left his work and his family, his employees, all of us who, who he touched at one point in time, he left his work in us and we're gonna pass that work forward. So much you can say about it. I don't think there's enough adjectives to describe how great of a man Pat Bowden truly was. And that's to me, that's the biggest testament about anybody. Forget, you know, whether a good player or a good owner, how good of a person are they? And Pat Bowden was the best. John Elway was three days into his vacation when he got the news last Tuesday night that Mr. B was down to his final days. Elway flew back to Denver said his goodbye to Mr. B on Wednesday, and Elway stayed here for the open house today. Pat Bolin loved John Elway, and clearly the feeling was mutual. John, first of all, my condolences. I know you and uh, Mr. B had an unusual and a wonderful relationship, quarterback, player, owner. Yeah, we really did, and I think that, uh, you know, obviously, uh, Tough time, but uh, you know I think Mr. B put up a heck of a fight, and and obviously this is a terrible disease, and but uh, you know I was so lucky uh, in my life that my family and I had an opportunity to work for him, and uh, you know the opportunities that he provided us and and, and uh, provided me um, has just been absolutely tremendous, and so. You know, other than my father, I don't know that Pat has had more of an influence. Anybody else had more an influence on my life than Pat, and, and, and for that, I'm very, very grateful. You know, just walking up here on the second floor of this building, that's when it kind of hit me that Mr. B's gone. I mean, the Broncos are the successful franchise they are today because of just how Mr. B was with his management style. No question, and you know, and I think the one thing that I was thought about, okay, what's the one thing that uh, uh, that I could say about Pat that people would remember and that you know what I think it's that you know He ran this team with his heart rather than this pocketbook and set the standard of we're gonna compete for world championships And that's what he wanted. He was a great competitor and there's not a better, you know better owner as a player or You know or a general manager to work for than a guy that you know wants to be successful on the field and wants to wants to win football games and so when the standard set at the top like that it's much easier to carry it on as a manager down throughout the organization. I think it was more when you were a player than as a GM, but from what I understand, there was times where you had to sign a player and do you have the money or do you not have the money? And Mr. B had to figure out how to get the money. I mean, he was to the bottom line dollar to make this team the best. He did. And, you know, he wasn't obviously, you know, the wealthiest owner in the NFL, but, uh, you know, he was when it came down to using every resource to try to figure out how to get something done if we needed a player or, or whatever we needed. And so that's why he was great and we were able to, you know, to win a lot of football games because of that mentality. That moment, and it's his most iconic moment, I think a hundred years from now they're going to play this one's for you. That moment for you, what was it like? Well, I mean, I was actually shocked and I mean that we were all, you know, uh, in that in that spot, just so thrilled to be in where we were and having finally won a world championship. And then, you know, to Pat 
you know, to, to say that uh, with the Lombardi Trophy, uh, you know, it took me by surprise, very much by surprise, but very gratifying and, and something that I'll always remember. And I think, uh, you know, to be able to return that favor and, and do that in Super Bowl 50. But this one's for Pat! It was, uh, you know, a close second to, the, to that one. I think there might be eventually, once the morning is over, there's going to be some uneasiness about the future of the Broncos without Mr. Bolin. How do you think this franchise will carry on? Well, I think Joe Ellis has done a tremendous job of trying to carry out uh, Pat's legacy and, and having, you know, when Joe worked for Pat for so long and, and spent the time around him, Joe knows what Pat wanted. And, uh, and I think Joe's doing a tremendous job trying to carry that vision out. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of a little bit of pressure, I would think, on you. People are going to want a good season for Mr. B. Oh, yeah. Well, there's you, you think, that's always there anyway. And yeah, I, right. You know, and uh, I'm sure Mr. B is looking down going, we better have a good season. So yeah. uh, he applied that pressure very well, too. And so, yeah, we know that uh, it's a big year for us. We're looking forward to it. And, uh, uh, you know, as I said, it's a big challenge. But uh, feel good about where we are, and we'll uh, take it one week at a time. Other owners don't have this love from the players that Mr. B had. What do you think it was about him where the players – really loved him and wanted to play for him. Well, again, I get back to the same thing as I think he put his heart in front of the, the playbook. And so therefore he never got involved on the, you know, he hired his people, as you've heard so many times, he delegated very well. He hired his players, he hired his people to hire the money side. And Pat never had to get involved in the money side. And so therefore I think, and that he didn't want to be because he didn't want to ruin that relationship with the players that he had. And so that's why he was able to be out there practice, be able to have a relationship with him, be able to over Hawaii take his players and made the Pro Bowl out to dinner to his restaurant, be proud about that. So I think he kept that space. And uh, by keeping that space, it allowed him to have that personal relationship with his player. Great story on Elway saying that El. Uh, Mr. B governed with his heart rather than his checkbook. Yeah. They wanted Simeon Rice before the 2007 season. Mike Shanahan wanted another pass rusher to go with Elvis Toomerville. Simeon Rice was out there, second all-time or second active sacker in, in the league. Three million dollars is all it took. The only problem was Pat Bolin didn't have three million. That's a problem. So what did he do? He took out a personal line of credit from a bank to get the three million and, and sign Simeon Rice. It didn't work out, but Pat Bolin wow. literally took money out of his own pocket to make the Broncos better. So interesting, because you hear guys say, Elway reiterated it yesterday, every resource he had, he put into that football team. 1984, that's the year the Broncos became Pat Bowens. Bowen bought the team from Edgar Kaiser Jr., signed the deal in Hawaii. So Nine News sent Mike Nolan to the islands to get the Bronco fans their very first look at the team's new owner. Build a good football team. I think we've got a very good nucleus there now, and uh, we'll continue to spend money if we need to to get good football players. Edgar, what advice could you give him? Going in as an owner of NFL, you've had it for three years. What advice could you give him? The best advice I can give him is no advice at all. He'll do a fine job of it, and he's got a good organization to work with. You familiar with the Broncos, are you, Pat? What do you know about them? I'm fairly familiar with the organization. I've met all the coaches. Uh, I've followed them throughout the last year. Uh, I, I'm really pleased with the organization, as a matter of fact. I don't intend to change anything there, at least uh, through the first season. So I mentioned that Mike Nolan was there. So was Broncos historian Jim Sakamano. In fact, you were alongside Mr. B for so many years. Can you take us back to that time, the first memories oh, yeah. of the Broncos owner? Well, I get a call. I've got to go meet with this attorney. He represents the new owner. So I go down to the hotel. I meet with this attorney, Bill Britton, very close friend of Pat's. The next day I pick him up, and it's kind of a surreal thing. I picked up Pat Bolin, not a cavalcade of uh, security guys, just me. I picked him up. He's in the back seat. I'm in the front. I'm nervous as heck. And I say, uh, gee, Mr. Bolin, uh, I've got some talking points for you. He says, what are talking points? <laughs> yeah. I said, well, maybe some things that the media might ask you in ways you might answer. He said, I'm not worried about that. They can ask anything they want, and I'll answer it the best I can. He never looked at the talking points. And I remember thinking, this might be really, really good. And it was really, really great for four decades. He uh, had a reputation that preceded him. A Canadian Pat, a lot of people didn't know. What did, what did you think about Mr. Bolin before you met him? I didn't know him before I met him. I didn't know him at all until I got a I mean, call. What did you think he was like? 
Uh, I, well, I knew he was going to be the owner, and I knew we were going from Edgar F. Kaiser Jr., who was uh, Kaiser Aluminum, Kaiser Steel, Kaiser Permanente, yeah. uh, a little, uh, little buttoned up. But I get the call from our GM uh, in Hawaii, and he said, I guess the cat's out of the bag, <laughs> eh? And I said, I guess it is. And then it just happened really fast. Next thing you know, you've met Pat, and he's Pat. You know, like he said, call me Mr. Bolin, call me Pat, I don't care. But he did tell me, if anybody ever says they know me and my name is Patrick, Jim, they don't know me at all. <laughs> <laughs> that introductory press conference, you talked about the fact that he didn't want to have bullet points. What was it like for Mr. B to have that first time? The first time he stepped in front of the microphone in front of everyone. Oh, it was tremendous. He just did it. He answered the questions. And then I remember after the press conference, uh, I, Charlie Lee, and Mr. Boland went to the stadium and kind of did a quick tour of Mile High Stadium. For the first time he'd been to it, at least as uh, as the owner. And um, just very quickly, he was, he was a, a guy you could converse with at any time the door was open you could go talk about a problem with them and on a one-on-one -on -one level not like uh, the level of, a, of the owner versus uh, someone else who could be considered a minion i always thought he was forthright in those press conferences he told it like it was like oh it very was. much so that's why you guys not you in particular but everybody they couldn't wait to get to pat if they mm -hmm. could get to pat and pat would say to me yeah they want to talk to me because they know i'll tell them anything <laughs> but i'm not going to do it this time or he is going to do it one time he comes up from the practice field after meeting with all you guys and i never i never stood by him and babysat him i never have liked that anyway he comes up he peeks into my office he says I did it again. I said, what did you do? What did you say this time? Yeah. And he told me, and I called a few people and said, ah, Pat said this. And if you got a beef, call Pat. He's uh -oh. the owner. Jim, we talked about right before you came on the fact that he would give so much back to his team. But when it came to giving back, it certainly was not only about the team with Mr. Bowen. No, he would do anything for anybody, his players, the community. And he always said, the thing to do is to give, to donate, to pay for something, and shut up about it. <laughs> don't, don't pat yourself on the back and say, look what I did. And there were several instances when he, when you went to him, now the, you've documented, Mike, the millions that he gave away. But there were much smaller things where you might go to him and say, would you sponsor a third of this? And he'd say, no. Nah, that's a good cause. I'll pay for all of it, wow. but I don't want any publicity. You do not let the press know. And so, I mean, I really had to be careful that they said, well, who's paying for this? Don't worry about it. I was impressed. Peyton Manning and Pat ha Haggerty came out with statements the exact same day on Saturday. Of course, Peyton Manning loved Mr. B. Ha Haggerty, you remember, was a developmental squad quarterback yes. in 89, 90. Mm -hmm. And is, uh, there was a Elway Golf Tournament, celebs everywhere, stars everywhere. Haggerty was there, his uh, brother just died. And Mr. B called him over and a uh, table way away from the celebs and sat down and talked to him for about uh, five to 10 minutes about death and life and uh, said, if you need anything, uh, you, you call me. And that meant the world to the young man. Oh yeah, there were times he would talk to me about my kids. How are your kids doing? Are they out of, the, they're out of college, they're in the business world. He was interested in all aspects of his employees, and he didn't uh, put on any kind of airs. He was amazing, really, in that way. He was so close to so many people, obviously, you, but it's hard to imagine an honor higher than the one Steve Adonopoulos, Greek, recently received. He's going to be the presenter for the longtime owner of the Denver Broncos, something that the Bolin family actually asked him to do in Canton, Ohio. First of all, is to know him as a person. You know, he, he is a very humble person, which many people don't know that. He's a very proud person. You know, from the standpoint of being an owner, he's very competitive. Uh, and he was compassionate. Compassionate about his families. Uh, and I say families in the sense of his Boland family, the Bronco family, the Denver family, the fans. I mean, he was very compassionate about the community. You know, he was like a brother, and you know, sure he's the owner of the Denver Broncos, but I love him to death, and he's my friend. Jim, I think a lot of people outside the organization thought that Elway would be Mr. B's presenter. What did you think of the Greek? I thought that was a great choice, almost an inspired choice by the family. Nobody closer than Steve. You mentioned how Pat comes in in the morning. He would come in. First stop is the trainer. He sees how my guys do it, what's going on. Then 
I, I look at it though as as Greek was a friend of his, and he's every man. He represents every man, because Pat would be he'd be fine. He'd be polite with anybody at any level, but Pat's not necessarily the kind of guy where you say, "Gee, I I've got to have Roger Goodell or I've got to have John Elway." It's a vanity thing. Uh, I think he would he think a, that's a perfect yeah. choice. He was about behind the scenes. Very much so. And, and Greek was the king of behind the scenes. Absolutely. And uh, it's a perfect fit. I know Greek will do a great job, and he really is a perfect choice. You know, it's interesting because that shot we just showed of Greek today looking mm -hmm. at the tribute, and, and you could see that he got emotional looking at all this stuff yeah. of, of Mr. Bowen. Greek was there. Adam Schefter also among the many to attend today's tribute. He flew all the way from New York this morning. We'll fly back there tonight. The former Broncos beat writer telling the story about how special the plane ride home from Super Bowl 32 was with the Broncos owner. And not only did I fly home on the team plane with him, but I sat in first class with him in the Vince Lombardi Trophy. Now, if you're gonna fly a team charter, that's probably the way to do that. And that is the way that Pat always was. He always looked out for others. He was always giving to others. He did things in a first class kind of way. And I think that that's shown by the outpouring of love from all the people who are here today to pay their respects to him and the Bowen family. It's really interesting listening to Adam Shepard because everyone knows who he is. I mean, the, the Twitter followers this man has is incredible, but he wasn't always like that. He wasn't always this big shot, and yet Mr. Bowen treated him like one. He really did. Of course, Adam worked very, very hard. I'm sure he still does now, but early in his career, he's one of those guys just putting in a lot of hours and everything and kind of starting to, to make his mark in that way. And, uh, and he was candid. He was honest. And... Um, if, if somebody asked him to hold something for a day, he would hold it for a day or whatever. It became very close. And uh, he and Pat were very, very close friends. Um, I remember actually, uh, so we were going to draft Delta O'Neill, state secret. Boy, we don't tell anybody. But uh, there's a banquet. Pat's going to the banquet. It's a Friday night banquet, the night before the draft. Adam, as a social guy in the community, buys a ticket to the banquet. He goes, he sees Pat. He says, what are you going to do? Oh, we're going to take Delta O'Neill. Oh. The next morning, Coach Shanahan comes to my office and says, where did this come from? <laughs> All kinds oh, of tricks. Fantastic. Yeah, but, uh, but uh, yeah, Adam was very, very close to the organization and to Pat Bullock. Jim, thanks so much for coming out. Thank thanks you for very sharing much. Thank memories. you, Michael. Jim Sakamoto, everyone. Jim, thank you. This one's for John. No doubt the most famous words Pat Bowen ever uttered. Words that say so much. It wasn't about him. It was about his players. Now, Elway, of course, special, but to Mr. B, they all were. I love Mr. B. Uh, he's just a, he was just a great person anyway, you know, outside of football. I just, and he was an athlete, too. Well, everything always starts at the top. You know, if, you, if you're going to have a winning team, you better have a winning owner. And what I mean by that is the way he treats his players, his coaches, and how that trickles down, I mean, it means everything. It always starts at the top, first class all the way. You knew how competitive Mr. B was, and you saw it, but he always let us do our job. You know, Pat has always treated all of his players very well and he, he's got a family atmosphere and you know I would do anything for him and uh, you know he just I wish I would have played my whole career for that man. He's just been great. He's a, he's a great guy and every step of the way of my career I can honestly say I know this guy was in my corner. And I love Pat Bowlen. He, he was the owner that um, that I think it was probably his decision to assist in drafting me here because he was an Oklahoma guy. Mm -hmm. I know when I first met him, he, he says yes. He said that he had, it, he was a, an alumni from the University of Oklahoma. So I think we had that instant connection automatically. When I when I walked through the doors and, and, I, and I met Mr. B and I met Coach Shanahan, man, it was just it was just a dream come true. When we would come back to Alumni Weekend, you know, he would always treat us, you know, with such respect because he had respect for the game and the play guys who played the game. You know, I know when somebody is your owner, he's sometimes um, your, your team owner, uh, you don't feel as close to that person, sure. but I really felt like uh, he was a friend. 
I really, really miss Pat Bowen, and I love Pat Bowen. You talk to these former players, you get all kinds of stories. You get the emotional ones, like you heard from Roma there. You get some lighter ones, too, like Dave Stutter talking about the uh, trips on the airplane. Yeah, we're going to the UPO! Yeah, man! So when I got on the plane, Dan shook my hand and said, congratulations. And as I'm walking by Dan in first class, and there was Mr. Bowden in the kind of the galleyway where the students yeah. were at, he goes, he goes, Dave, can I buy you a cocktail? And I go, we're not supposed to have cocktails. And he goes, do you want a drink or not? And I said, oh, sure, I have one. So he had a rack of Crown Royal right there. And so I poured us the double, and we had another double. And then everybody was getting on, and all of a sudden they said, need to evacuate the plane. Pat and I never got off the plane. Did you know that? That's great. I didn't did you know, know that? So Pat and I sat there on the plane. I sat here by the, he sat inside. So a guy came in with a dog, German Shepherd, and says, uh, sir, you need the plane. I said, talk to this gentleman right here. And I pulled back and he goes, oh, Mr. Bowen, uh, you guys can stay as long as you want. Pat said, go ahead and get the, get the dog through here and, and let us know when they're coming back. So we had another drink and uh, we talked about football and everything. That's the first time I really got to talk to him, one on one. They don't let them drink alcohol on a plane anymore. Maybe that's not such a bad thing. No, it's like we traveled at the wrong time. <laughs> yeah, we did. It's fun to hear stories like that, the behind the scenes, the stuff that you don't see from Pat Bowen. In fact, we've all heard the stories about how competitive he was, how giving he was. But as you just heard there, he had a lighter side as well. Mark Schlereth telling the story recently of how Pat participated in one of his pranks on former Orange Crush defensive star and at the time assistant coach Barney Chavis. Barney's in his office, so his door is closed. So I penny Barney in his office, and then I call Pat, and he's upstairs. And I said, hey, Pat, this stinks. He goes, yeah, what's up? And I go, I've got Barney Chavis, Chavis pennied in his office. There's no way he can get out. Do me a favor, call him up and tell, me, tell him you need to see him in your office immediately, <laughs> right? So he can't wait to get off the phone. Pat is like, okay, yeah, hang up, hang up, hang up. So we hang up, and all of a sudden the phone rings. Ring, ring, you know. And all Bar Barney's, hello? And Pat's like, you need to come to my office right now. And you should, Barney almost tore his, down the <laughs> wall, right? He can't get out of the office. And here comes Pat running down from upstairs in his office down to the weight room to see Barney trying to get out. And there's like 20 of us, we're just howling. And he is, Barney is yelling at us. I mean, cussing us up one side and down the other. Oh, he was so angry. But, you know, here's Pat involved in, you know, the tomfoolery and the hijinks of a locker room. And he couldn't wait to be a part of it. So he was just great that way. The, the stories get better and better. Yeah, hey, Stink's a good one, too. It, it, he had a special relationship with his players, obviously, but he did with his coaches as well, including coaches who uh, yeah. at one point he had to get rid of. I tell you what, perhaps no relationship meant more to the success of the Denver Broncos than the one between Pat Bolin and Mike Shanahan. Their friendship formed when Shanahan was an assistant. It strengthened when Shanahan became the head coach. And even after Bolin had to fire Shanahan after 14 years, the two remained friends. You guys uh, built a lot of your relationship from that weight room, from what I understand. Oh, no, we, we got to know each other. I mean, we got, we're the best of friends. I mean, you talked about, we did everything together. Dinners, vacations, golf, but uh, yeah, I considered him as one of my best friends. We did we did everything together, and uh, so it's, it was quite fun. You've, you've been uh, around some uh, great owners, um, some not so great. Uh, not all of them are as beloved by the players and coaches like Pat Bowlin. Why did he have such a personal connection, do you think? What was it about him that he had that? Well, he was, he was there at practice. He was watching at practice. He was there in the weight room. He watched people do things, little things, and he would see if they were doing it the right way. And, you know, Pat was on top of football where, I mean, for me, every time he would come in, we'd sit down, we'd talk 15, 20 minutes. He'd ask how players were doing. He'd go through different different positions, and he was just he just wanted to be on top of things, and he never interfered and let you do your job at the same time. And then eventually, uh, Pat decided um, he had to let you go. How 
just talk about some of the emotions that was because you and him were so close for all those years. And we always were. Even at that time, we were very close. Mm -hmm. I mean, very close. So, I mean, I, I know the situation better than anybody, so I know exactly what did happen. So I always considered Pat one of my best friends, even when I got fired there and, you know, uh, after, you know, one of the tough seasons, you're 8-8, eight, eight, and at the same time, you know, the year before we were 9-7, and seven, you said, oh, my God, you know, this is tough, but you understand the pro uh, profession. And you'd be, you know, at the same time, I felt close up with Pat. I know what direction he was going and why he did it. How did you interact? I mean, the, the whole thing is that Pat Boland didn't interfere. But did you talk to him every day? I mean, he, he was around every day. Talked to him almost every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, throughout my whole career there as an assistant coach, as a head coach, mm -hmm. Pat would come in and we'd sit down and talk. We had that type of relationship, which was fun. Pat wasn't a guy that was trying to interfere. He just wanted to make sure he, he was on top of everything that was going on. So when you talked about the players, how they practice, what you saw about their potential, I don't care if it was a quarterback position, the running back position, defensive line, he was inquisitive on, hey, tell me what you think. Draft choices, free agents, hey, do we waste our money here? Or if you did make a mistake, you know, hey, Pat, made a mistake on this free agent. You know, not the character that we wanted, might have to make a change or draft choice. But as long as you were real with Pat and were honest with Pat, I mean, you had no problem with all because he just wanted to be informed and that's why he was such a great owner. Early on, I think maybe some people saw him as, uh, you know, maybe a aloof. He was a, he was a quiet guy, a shy guy by nature, wasn't he? Pat was always shy. Yeah. In fact, when uh, back there in 97, 98, when we were going for the stadium, that's where you saw Pat kind of get out, out of, in town a little bit more, yeah. where he was speaking, doing more speaking engagements. And I had never seen Pat do that. If anything, he was going to shy away from any of those speaking engagements. But, you know, to get that stadium, he had to go out there and, and speak. And he really got very good and something you could see he enjoyed. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons I think we got the stadium. You guys got to the mountaintop and uh, he's finally got a chance to take a bow. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he does is, let me get out of here and turn it over to John. This one's for John. Well, that's Pat. I mean, if you knew Pat at all, I mean, very humble. Always wanted to stay out of the spotlight. But at the same time, he knew that he had a standard that he wanted to uh, instill in the organization. He knew that, you know, his legacy was going to be winning championships. You knew that? You felt it as oh, yeah. the head coach? Oh, without a question. When he came in, that's what he talked about. And uh, when I did get away for a few years, and we, we talked. And you could tell that, you know, that bothered him. Not, he, he wasn't happy with getting there. He wanted to separate himself, and he, he knew. And of course, of all people, John knew. He wanted to make sure that John had the best opportunity to at least put a ring on his finger, and that wanted to be one of the reasons why he did it, and he was. And it's fascinating, too, because John actually talked about how overwhelmed he was when Pat Bowen did that because he didn't know it was coming. By the way, it was nice of you to invite Mike Shanahan to your house <laughs> yeah. to have that interview, Mike. I tell you what, I got there a little later than the bosses, uh, Brian and John, and uh, <laughs> Mike was in the back getting fixed up for the interview. And Brian tried to open the door. He couldn't figure out how to open the door for a few seconds. That door is worth more than my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great, Mike. As yeah. we move on now, um, you, you wanted to talk about um, oh, your, your next story. You know, Mike, Mike Shanahan, he was loyal to Mike Shanahan. But yeah. before that, he showed loyalty to Dan Reeves. Yes. He inherited Dan Reeves. Dan Reeves talked about how he, you know, he thought he was going to get fired when the team was sold. He was hired by Edgar Kaiser. The new owner yes. always wants him in. And then uh, yeah. Dan Reeves, Pat Bowlen came in. Mike Shanahan, too, by the way, had just been hired two weeks earlier than, than, yeah. Pat Bowlen, than Pat Bowlen was hired as an assistant. So uh, they were very relieved, Reeves was, that Pat Bowlen showed loyalty to the guy he inherited for nine years. Let's hear from Dan. Pat Bowlen came in here. You know, with the Denver Broncos, he gave us everything that we could possibly need you know, to succeed. You know, so Pat, you know, has continued that, you know, for 30 years as owner, do you look at his record, uh, you know, he's accomplished an awful lot. So, you know, it starts, you know, with ownership.
Brad Bowen deserves most of the credit for all of the Broncos' success for all of those years, but he didn't want it, not any of it. Mr. Bowen was all about the team, his players, and his coaches. They're the reason they won. Let's relive that Hall of Fame career through Pat Bowen's own words. You familiar with the Broncos, are you, Pat? What do you know about them? I'm fairly familiar with the organization. I've met all the coaches. Uh, I've followed them throughout the last year. Uh, I, I'm really pleased with the organization, as a matter of fact. I don't intend to change anything there, at least uh, through the first season. You know, I'm, I'm going into this thing hoping that, uh, that, that we're going to win every game, and obviously we're not. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I have a great deal of faith that I can put together a good ball club and one that the fans in Denver are going to be very proud of. I'm not involved in football for, for ego gratification or for the publicity that surrounds it. I'm involved in it for a career. Sean Elway and the Broncos are headed for Pasadena. We're in the Super Bowl. I thought it would take us five years. We're there in three. And, uh, you know, I hope 30 years down the road they look at this as a dynasty. But he won't stand for any bickering when the strike ends. You know, I'll tell you exactly how I feel about that. I mean, I'm, I run this football team. Uh, this is my team and my family's team. And anybody who can't accept people who make individual decisions doesn't deserve to be around here. And if, if we have problems with that uh, when, the, uh, when the team is back, uh, if we have problems with people who can't respect other people's decisions, I can tell you exactly how Dan and I feel about it. And I think that's enough said. Kozar to Biner, Biner trying to slip left at the five, he's at the goal line, Biner loses the ball, Broncos come away with a football. Because that was, I was all prepared to go into overtime at that stage. John Elway has done it again, have won the AFC Championship for the fourth time. Thanks Lamar, I'm sort of getting used to taking this trophy from you, it's the third time, and I'm uh, really proud of my team. When the uh, owner or the chief executive officer of the team loses confidence in his staff, it's unfair to them to keep them on. To introduce the new head coach of the Denver Broncos, Mike Shanahan. <laughs> Bringing Shanahan here and having him here as the head coach, I think is gonna pay great dividends to me and, and, and to the fans. They have shocked everybody and they have won Super Bowl 32. This one's for John. I'll never have to think again about a Super Bowl loss. I mean, this is a win, and hopefully we'll have some more, and the losses are way behind us. I don't plan to move this club, but if a new stadium isn't built, I've got three choices. I play in mile high and go in the toilet, or I move the club, which I said to this room I'm not going to do, or I sell the club. And the last two are synonymous. When I think that we got 400,000 votes yesterday to build this uh, stadium, uh, I, I, I'm very gratified, uh, both to uh, the, uh, the fans and the voters. Broncos have done it again. Second straight year, they are AFC champions. The Denver Broncos have beaten the Atlanta Falcons 34 to 19, and they are world champions once again. It felt very good, you know, because we have been on the on the wrong end of three, and we've been on the right end of two now. So we're we're, we're starting to get close to even. Guns for you, John. When I look back at your career, I look more at it as a uh, it's what you did off the field, and believe me, and what you did on the field, and, and what you did on the field was unbelievable. Two things that, that, I, that were very important to me were the sight lines in the stadium, that they were the same as Mile High, that we had our fans as close to the field. From Vestro Field at Mile High. John was the man, you just said it, you know, for 16 years, and uh, a lot of people uh, became Broncos fans, I think, because of John outside of Colorado. He was out here to our ring of fame. One of the greatest players in my opinion. 
I'm very proud of all of you. You know, I mean, I really am. I appreciate you've got a hell of a football game. <laughs> I love it. I look forward to great things in the future. I think uh, John will return this team to a very high level of competitiveness. I think we'll win some more Super Bowls. And uh, I won't be saying this one's for John. Maybe be saying this one's for Pat. We're looked at as one of the premier organizations in the world, sports organizations in the world now. And, and you know, I take a great deal of pride in that. Humble, honest, generous, and competitive. That's how Joel has described Pat Bowen the other day. That is certainly accurate, as you see from that story there with Pat, in his own words, wanting to talk about others instead of himself. And it's just, it's too bad. I know it's so exciting he's going into the Hall of Fame this year, but it's just too bad it didn't happen before because he certainly deserved it. In fact, when he did get honored, when they did mention finally that he was going to be inducted, you were there and were able to talk yeah. to his children about it. Yeah, that was a thrill. Pat Bowen was married twice and raised seven children growing up as kids of the Denver Broncos owner had its ups and downs but through it all they learned life lessons from their dad that they will never forget he was the best dad ever he gave me the most amazing advice every time I needed it and even when I was getting bullied at school for my dyslexia I would come to school and make everything better uh, it made him a little bit mad, but he said, I have a dyslexia as well, and you have to be a fighter. I think of when I found out of, I had a brain tumor and pretty bad epilepsy, and my dad had Alzheimer's already, but was still there for me, and he told me, you're a fighter, and you can do this. He's a family man first, absolutely, um, but he's also a businessman and and just caring about his family and caring about the business and caring about everyone around him really showed a lot about him. The best piece of advice my dad gave me, he said, in order to succeed in this world, you have to stay competitive and you have to be strong. You know, he was very intelligent. He was very, in my opinion, humble in the sense that he didn't talk a whole lot. Um, you know, he'd listen. He was very thoughtful. He was very, wanted to make sure his players had everything possible. Most of my stories revolve around canoe surfing or seeing my dad running or biking, yeah. training for the triathlon. Um, he was, you know, just like a, I mean, I, I can't say like any other dad because I don't know how other dads are, but for me, he was like dad. I mean, he was strict and intense, yeah. but fun and um, loving. He said, Brittany, you have to understand. And I said, what does that mean? Understand the big picture understand people and where they come from, understand the business. And he said, you have to have fun. Enjoy what you do. Live your life in a way that brings you joy. And the last one was, Brittany, you have to kick ass and take names. <laughs> and I think that shows a little bit of his competitive side that, you know, he wanted us to have drive. He wanted us to do what was important to us. Um, those were the kind of moments that we got to have with him as children. Could you imagine family dinner at the Bolin household? It was on Saturdays, by the way. Sundays, of course, were for the Broncos. The Bolins love roasted chicken. Potatoes, a second drink, and a dessert, though, were often taboo. Mr. B, it seems, had his quirks. Saturday nights, I would look forward to it. Really? I knew it was coming and that we were all going to sit down as a family. And when we did eat dinner together, it was a lot of fun. It was just about being happy. and being a family and forgetting everything else. On Saturdays, if we were eating at home, we had a roast chicken. Okay. Yeah, he loved roast chicken, but he hated potatoes. He used to say he ate too many of them in boarding school. Uh, he had a lot of go-to favorite meals. Uh, he enjoyed seafood a lot. 
we were never allowed to order dessert. Really? Yes. And it was, you know, it was really funny. I think it's because he really wanted it, but he knew if it all, if we ordered dessert, that uh, you know, he he'd have to get one too. You couldn't order dessert unless he was ordering dessert. Uh. But if he was ordering dessert, then he'd be like, well, maybe we should get the whole, whole menu of dessert. You know, there were gonna be, you know, tears, but there also was gonna be fun. And my dad making us laugh. He always would make everybody laugh at the dinner table. I think Pat and Annabelle did well with those kids. They absolutely did, all, each and every one of them. We had Jim Sacamano here earlier, a long time. He was a public relations, media relations, along with Pat Bowen. And then Patrick Smythe took over, who also had wonderful things to say about the Broncos owner. Mr. Bowen is an owner who, he checked all the boxes. I think Paul Tagliabue, the former commissioner, said he was the only owner involved in, in all four areas of, of the growth of the league television, labor, uh, international, new stadium development. And in addition to that, the unprecedented su success he had uh, with the Broncos, averaging 10 wins a year, uh, top five in the history of pro football, um, seven Super Bowl appearances, three world championships. This one for John. I think one of the things that makes Mr. Bowen a great owner is he never wanted the attention. He never wanted the credit. It was always about the players. It was always about the fans, where he said, it's not my team, this team belongs to the fans. And he was much more comfortable being in the background and, and making sure everyone else, the coaches, the players, even the fans, uh, were the ones who deserved the credit and the ones who received the credit. The way it often worked with Pat Bolin, he wanted the best players, even if the bankroll was low. He asked his bankers and business guys to figure out how to get the money. In our sit-down conversation Monday, Joe Ellis confirmed what John Elway said about Mr. B. He governed with his heart, not his checkbook. I love the Mr. B decal that's going to be on the helmets. You're wearing a pin right there. I mean, I thought it might be uh, PDB or PB, the initials. I love the Mr. B yeah. part of it. Well, that's how he was known, you yeah. know, and that the players all referred to him as, as that. And uh, he liked that, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, you know, it's, he, uh, he had a real presence with the players, whether it was the training camp visits, whether it was his little college football pick and pool that he did with Steve and John and others down in the training room area, and certainly in, a, in the lunch hall, and, and most importantly, I think, at practice. Pat went to practice almost every day when he could, when he was here, and he was here almost all the time. Uh, and that had an impact on the team. You know, I think the coaches coached hard. I think the players knew that, hey, he cares a lot about this, so. I'm going to give him everything I have, and I think that was really a part of the team's, uh, a key part of the team's success throughout his years as an owner. You know, and you've been here the last few years uh, with Mr. B not being in the office, but it it hit me today coming up on the second floor. You know that uh, Mr. B isn't here anymore. I mean, have you had some of those thoughts and emotions? Yeah, I have. I had him when Annabelle came over, and, and she was in the office, and the finality of it, and. You know, the, she was talking to me, and I, I, I kind of got caught distracted by looking around Pat's office and seeing things and remembering meetings that I had in there. And, and uh, it was pretty emotional. Uh, the finality of it, John Elway did a nice job of describing that. It's always difficult, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the best we can do is to carry on with the way he would want us to carry on. Um, and. Uh, I'm hopeful for more success on the field, keep doing great things off the field. Um, you know, there's, everybody knows the blueprint. We just got to deliver for him and for the fans and everybody in this community. Among the many things that made him unique as an owner is he wasn't a billionaire like so many of the others, you know? To, to him, this was his job. This was how he earned his own little paychecks. From what I understand, there were some times where Mr. B uh, he wasn't sure how he was going to sign this player, but he figured out a way. He, he came up with that bottom last dollar to help this team be the best it could be. He was uh, the eternal optimist when it came to finances. <laughs> and uh, uh, me, not so much. Yeah. Um, but, um, 
but but he but you're right he always found a way to get it done and boy we were charged with getting it done and uh you know you always you had to de deliver you wanted to deliver because it was all about putting money back into the team and getting better on the field and and pat was not defined by his status as an owner in his mind he was defined by championships and everything he could do to be a good corporate citizen in the community uh, and and he felt that you know you're, you're only going to be remembered for winning. I mean, he he was fiercely competitive, uh, and he was he, he understood athletics. He played sports as a kid, and and he competed as a triathlete on a high level, and so he understood uh, the the art of competition. And uh, you know, some owners get into it, and they're not. It's not as clear for them. And for Pat, it was very very clear. And I think that's why right from the start. His relationship with Dan Reeves, then his relationship, uh, he had Wade for a bit, and his relationship with Mike for so many years. I think both Dan and uh, Mike Shanahan expressed very clearly this past weekend uh, why Pat was such a good owner. And part of that was his competitiveness and his desire to win and give you everything you needed to win. Uh, and so I think that really was such an important part of his success. Now we look at Joe Ellis as an executive, CEO, president. His entire life was changed by Mr. Bull, and he worked side by side with him with, for over 20 years. Big loss for him. Absolutely. I like what he said about the Mr. B decal that they're going to put on their helmet that he was wearing, that he probably wouldn't have wanted it, but he owed it to him, he believed, to honor him that way. You know, today was a special day. We talked about everyone who was over at Mile High. That included Michael Hancock, who actually has a special tie to Pat Bowen and the Broncos. Before he was the Denver mayor, he was Huddle's the mascot. That job earned him a trip to the happiest place on earth. When they went to the Super Bowl that year against uh, the New York Giants, uh, Pat Bowlen requested that I get on the plane and be a part of that Super Bowl contingent. And not only that, then he got us there and he said, I'm sending everybody to Disneyland. Um, and to, I was like, whoa, here's a 17-year-old you know, from Five Points, not only flying on the Broncos charter plane, but going to Disneyland thanks to Pat Bowlen. He took every staff member, whether you were the janitor uh, in this uh, stadium or Mile High Stadium, the mascot or John Elway, he took care of you and the family, and that, that's who Pat Bowling was. Great tribute today at Mile High Stadium. The fans poured out. Private funeral for Mr. B on Monday. Today was certainly special, and that'll be emotional on Monday as well. Thanks for watching Pat Bowling, a Mile High legend. We'll leave you with a photo finish. Good night.